All right, everybody. Let's get started. My name is Colin. I am with Job Adder. I am here to kind of mediate some of our panelists here today. So we're going to go through, introduce everybody. Today we're talking about how tech helps you handle volume and scale. So we're really going to be kind of peeling the onion back. We're going to be talking about what kind of things you should be looking for in your tech to be able to help yourself scale, be ready for volume. I mean, I know a lot of us are seeing a real upswing in volume over the last several months. I know we're going to see some more coming in the next few months. So what can we be doing now to be laying those foundations, getting those building blocks ready? And what kind of things are we thinking maybe isn't an issue, but maybe might be down the road? And so we've brought some experts here together to really sit back, chat with you all a little bit, answer some questions, have some lively discussions here on this panel while we kind of dive into that piece. First and foremost, uh, I'm going to welcome AJ Wallace. AJ, you want to introduce yourself? Hey guys, my name is Angela Wallace. I go by AJ. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Data Rock Recruitment Firm. We're a startup staffing agency. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, Welcome, AJ. Great to have you again. Next, we've got Jack Thank Copeland, uh, CEO and co-founder of Staffing Future. Jack. Hey, yeah, thanks, Colin. My name is Jack Copeland. Um, I've been in the industry about 16, 17 years, and for the last few years, I've been the CEO and co-founder of Some Future. We build sort of tech-enabled, um, uh, workflow-driven websites for staffing and recruitment companies. Awesome. And then we have Andrea Garvey here with us uh, from talent.com. Andrea, great to have you. Hi, Colin. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Andrea. Um, I work for Talent.com, um, which is a job aggregator. Um, but like Jack, I've been in the industry around about 16 years. And um, prior to moving to Talent.com early this year, um, I was an IT recruiter. So uh, feel the, the pain of people. <laughs> this is a very sad <laughs> topic. <laughs> yeah, we're really excited to have you on board. My name is Colin. I am our manager of implementations here in North America. I'm also a recovering recruiter myself, having sat at a desk for about 10 years in IT, and I'm really enjoying the sidelines view as it sits right now. Um, so we definitely want to thank all of you guys for coming with us today. As I mentioned before, we're going to be kind of diving into a few different topics today. We're going to have some time here to go over questions. So just kind of a general overview of what we're talking about today is really diving into that how can we kind of reevaluate the tech what tech is out there how can we help ourselves while we're trying to work on some little bit higher volume and scale without kind of losing our touch our culture what makes us different right whoever wants to set themselves apart and how to make sure we're still kind of keeping that candidate experience intact right while still getting our job done and still being able to scale so some of the topics that we're going to be discussing today are kind of making getting the most out of our tech stack maximizing efficiency through AI, and really handling quality without compromising quality. So again, that kind of piece I just touched on a second ago, where we're talking about, hey, how can we scale? How can we be dealing with more candidates with more open recs, but still making sure that we're still having a good candidate experience, we're still taking care of the candidate, we're still taking care of the client, and that we're still, you know, crossing those T's and dotting those I's. So without further ado, we're going to kind of really dive in here to our first question, and that's on the topic of making um you know making sure you're getting the most out of your tech stack and so really the first thing here is how often should recruiters be evaluating their current tech stack based on what is available for volume hires jack yeah, you know, I mean, I think it's a, it's a difficult one, right? Because the tech stack should always be in evolution. Um, so I, I don't think it's something that you necessarily want to, you know, evolute, like look at the whole time in terms of evaluating the tech stack. But I think you should be in a position where really you should probably look at it in three kind of kits. So, um, you know, every year you should probably be looking at your wider tech stack. That doesn't mean I'm suggesting you maybe look at moving away from your ATS or, you know, something that's a real big ticket item, but looking at the elements that you've got that you purchased, looking at um, whether they're efficient and if they're implemented properly, looking at that ROI, and then looking at, you know, what can you add in sort of next um, to try and, and, and sort of slowly grow and, and evolve it and get more efficiency across the board. With that said, I think when it comes to sort of, you know, volume, you do need to look at it on a case-by-case -case project to try and get efficiency maybe on some slot items so you know we've had some clients where they're in the process of implementing a new ats they're in the pro process of implementing a new website 
but they got a project in the middle of COVID and they realized, hey, I can go and deploy something potentially that's going to make that project a third more efficient from an automation point of view. So even though I've got these wider projects on, I'm just going to go and try and, and, and my, my profitability by a third on this, on this one individual project just by removing some element of admin, automating perhaps some, some client or candidate onboarding or something along those lines. So, and, and then you've also got the individual recruiter element, which, you know, realistically you should be keeping close to what your recruiters and your salespeople are doing all the time with their Chrome extensions, what's working, trying to share that knowledge. So, you know, um, I think project by project basis for the bigger ones, the bigger ticket items, bigger clients, it's worth putting some quick thought into, is there something I could do here? Um, but probably yearly is really where you want to keep an eye on things to go, you know, are we missing a trick? And that evaluation shouldn't just be around what we're using. It should be, you know, do we need to remove items that don't get an ROI? And then also, have we implemented what we thought properly? Because I think that's probably one of the most, the most missed items in terms of sort of tech stack evaluation. Agreed. And there's a couple of pieces that I definitely love. I love the fact of, you know, you, you really mentioned there making sure you're keeping in touch with your recruiters to find out what they're using, right? Maybe you've implemented some stuff that you, from, from that 30,000 foot, you thought was a great idea, but are your recruiters using it? And if they are, how are they using it, right? And so, you know, being able to track that's really, really important. So we have that ROI, like you mentioned. And then that, that last piece I really kind of hit home with me clearly with, with my background too is, is, is it implemented correctly, right? I think, you know, we see a lot of times when we implement software, and I know it happens with me and clients all the time, initially, hey, here's how I want it. This is what we're gonna use it for. But the best part is, is let's come back at 90 days. Let's come back at six months and find out, well, hey, we're actually leveraging it this way now. And instead of figuring out all these workarounds, maybe it's time to kind of retool that software to really work for your process. So there, there's opportunities there that your software might be able to be capable of doing the things that you're looking for it to do, but you just hasn't been implemented correctly or your process has changed and you haven't had the software retooled to help kind of that new process. I, I love both those points. Um, next one we've got here is, what types of tech and automation have provided you the most value in your recruitment process? AJ? Yeah, mate. Um, so I guess, you know, just as a, um, you know, startup agency, you know, being that we're growing, um, I definitely found myself in a situation where I needed to, you know, make two of me or, or triple me <laughs> because the, the flow of candidates are starting to come in heavy now that people are getting, are vaccinated, offices are opening back up. Um, so one automation tool that I, it's a they're very similar, but one I use is, um, I use an automation tool called Meet Alfred. And it's really good when it comes to, you know, just making sure that I'm consistent, following up with candidates, you know, um, you know, you can, you can send follow-up stages, you know, when you follow up with them every two to three days, you also can connect with them through LinkedIn, um, Twitter, and also it has a lot of email mass you know, uh, masks that you can send out to candidates as well. It's just very important because I'm, I'm from, I'm sure from, you know, as you know, oh, one of the things that people say about recruiters often is that, you know, especially from the candidate side is that we don't follow up, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's just good to have, you know, uh, you know, have these automation tools. Another one similar to me out for is it's duck soup and, and octopus and, um, but it's just, you know, um, it's really, you know, the, the convenience of automation is just so important because I guess one of the things I think, as we all can agree, one of the things that, you know, recruiters probably don't like to do the most is the, the process of reference checks because it's, the, you know, you're trying to get in touch with the hiring manager and, you know, but I think, you know, the benefits of having an automation to set up to help you you know, speed up that process versus trying to contact someone if they're in meetings, you know, when they could just answer it through their, their mobile phone or uh, through email real quick versus talking to them for 20 or 30 minutes. It just helps out a lot. But it's, you know, it's these are the, the tools that I'm using right now um, that are really just benefiting me in, in so many ways. Um, I'm just thinking with, with me, Alfred, as well. But it's just, it's just also good because, you know, like I said, I have this two running for me every day I wake up it just automatically turns on and it just goes at it reaching out to candidates 
and also helping manage and balance my relationships with clients as well. Perfect. I love that. I love that. Um, Andrea, I'm, I'm excited. I really want to hear your take on some of this stuff. Yeah. I think um, some of the, um, the the key sort of technologies that really helped me when I was, you know, recruiting hands on um, was actually a video platform. Um, I know there's it was quite new and, you know, woo, fandangled when uh, we started using it and there's more and more that are coming onto the market. Um, but it was just really handy because I think in the age of sort of, you know, social media is a lot more prevalent. I'd say that's another piece of tech that's really sort of helping recruiters now. Um, but the video platform was great because, you know, you could set up meetings, you could do interviews on the on the video platform. Um, you know, you, as far as even your clients, you know, you could put a client in a room and, a, and the candidate in a room and they can meet that way and especially with covid you know we're, we're used to video chats now after this last year um but i think video sort of technology um really pushed things forward um we had functionalities where you know you could upload the cv you could put screening questions on it so it sort of um takes out a bit of time of your day i suppose um and the client's day as well obviously everyone still wants that human interaction um, but like AJ said, again, it's a way of sort of a bit of a paper trail as well, all in one place. Yeah. Um, and, you know, recruiters are lazy. You know, I was lazy. You've got a million and one things to do. Um, so if you can do it all on one platform, I mean, I know we have CRMs and things, but I think a lot of candidates, it was it was a bit hit and miss. Um, not every candidate wanted to do a video interview. They wanted to see someone face to face, which is fair enough. Um, but I think it's just how you package it up in the first place, really. You know, you might have to yeah. do a video interview for your first couple of stages, but don't worry, you're going to meet a human at some point. Um, but yeah, I thought think that, that the video and um, yeah, social media as a whole, you know, we did a, a heap of work over WhatsApp, you know, gone are the days of just telephone and you know even twitter you know um publishing jobs on there and things like that so um i think those two are sort of moving forward um very prevalent yeah. in the process no and i and i love that video piece right because i think now with this covid piece everyone's far more comfortable with video everyone's used to kind of having a zoom call and people are used to now having interviews via zoom oh, and i think that's a great point <laughs> Yeah, and it's a perfect time to leverage that, right? This technology has been out for a very long time for video interviews or, you know, you can send someone a link and they can answer five questions via video. And then as a recruiter, you could send that video to the hiring manager and they can immediately make their determination of yes or no, if I want to hire them or I want to interview them or I'm not interested, right? And so mm -hmm. right now, it's a great time to leverage that because people are more comfortable now in front of the webcam, more comfortable doing things that way why not just continue that forward because that makes your recruiter more efficient that you know is a far better candidate experience and a far better experience for the client right i mean how great would a client love this you know especially when we're talking temp and high volume too yeah if if you know i'd love to see the five people that are going to show up at eight o'clock and be able to pick like yep that guy seems perfect that guy's perfect nope i'm not interested in that one etc mm -hmm. so i think that's a great great idea and i think Our for the the recruiters yeah. themselves as well just as a final point um it was a really good tool for sort of prospecting as well um you know rather than picking up the phone and doing a cold call um you know you can yeah. make a video make it funny you know have a sign saying hi mr blah 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 mrs blah 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 mm -hmm. and, you yeah. know, kind of get a hold of you and yeah try and it, stand it, out it's a different take isn't it i mean people probably are a bit sick to death of uh, vcs after this last year but um i think it's a, it's a it's a different route to entry isn't it rather than you yeah. know email or a, or a cold call oh absolutely completely agree um our last question here on this topic is are there are there any manual processes that could be automated in your work what do you think about that one jack i know that one's a good one with you so, so yeah i've been i've been in the staffing tech industry for like 17 years but i was only a recruiter for about six months uh, and back then we used to send it was in, and it was in a very non-tech enabled company even for then. So, you know, they used to send out like a thousand resumes by post today. So, <laughs> um, you know, but I'll answer this rather than as us like from, from the point of view of my clients, because we, we work very closely with them on their, on their automation and their processes. And I think most companies will find if they really take the step back and they, they kind of take the time to work on the business, not just in the business, that there's always manual elements that they can remove. I mean, if you, if you think about it, you've got, you know, marketing automation from the point of view of trying to drive that candidate or, or sales engagement. You've got, you know, workflow automation from the point of view of just like 
you know, as 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 Ajalon was mentioning or AJ was mentioning, following up with candidates, making sure you notify them of what the status is, you know, everything from wish happy birthday to reminding them where they're going to go for their interview or where they're going to start or, you know, automation to chase you to follow up with them. Mm -hmm. You've got all the middle office and back office processes that still a lot of companies don't necessarily do a great job of. And then even, even when it comes to things like reporting and dashboards, which we don't think of as automation, but there's some really great platforms out there and some really great you know softwares that you utilize to try and bring all that reporting into one place and put it in front of you and and that may not seem like you know an automation or but or a manual process but realistically it is if you're either not looking at the full life cycle of what you're doing or you're not or you're not able to gather that process that that data in one place without manually sort of doing those pieces um and then there's 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 other elements as well as we touched on with you know perhaps what routers are doing sort of day to day so you know there's always stuff that i think you can use it's always going to depend on the industry you know massively depending on what level of professional recruiting how high touch it is you know is it direct placement is it hourly whether you want to go down that route of trying to automate some of the recruit behaviors whether it's you know something as basic as booking meetings or whether it's something as, as sort of you know evolved as using telephone automation to ask them three qualification questions for you know super transactional roles that we see coming back in say hospitality as as we get out of covid but there's always something that you can do on the wider business and then there's normally always stuff that you can do with with bigger projects as well yeah yeah Yeah. i I think one there you touched on that still kind of baffles me today and i don't think people understand the the amount of time it takes away is just booking appointments Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many emails do you send back and forth just to book a 15 minute phone stream with a candidate? I mean, that stop doing that. (laughs) There's some great software out there. There's Calendly, there's You Can Book Me, HubSpot, even Teams has got a link now that sync up with your calendar. You put rules in place. You say, hey, I don't ever want to have them back to back. I don't ever want to have more than four a day. And your email that says, hey, I love your resume, Jack, and I want to set up an interview should have click this link here to let's set up that phone screen, not please send me back a list of dates and times that work for you. Oh, nope, those don't work for me. Okay, how about two? I mean, that's so much time taken away. And, and I, ha- I had a couple of clients, you know, ask me about that. And I said, you know, it's about $90 a year if you want more than one link with Calendly. I know there's other options out there, but it, it, how much time is wasted for literally less than $10 a month, you can solve this issue. So now they're able to email five candidates, throw out those links and get five booked yeah. without having to play the back and forth 50 times. So there's a lot that people don't even realize there's some just tiny bits of technology because I think sometimes when we talk about technology, people think this huge Skynet, like we've got to implement this massive technology, you know, this software to to deploy it. Like, no, there's some really simple things out there to eliminate some of this admin that your recruiters are because right now they're not making, recruiters don't make money, you don't make money unless you're on the phone putting butts in seats. How can I eliminate some of that admin? And so again, you know, don't just look at it on this massive scale, look at it granularly. What are your recruiters doing day to day? And you think to yourself, man, that's taken a lot of your time. What can we do to facilitate getting rid of that? And, so, and, and think about it with the candidates. Think. I was just saying, and think about it from the candidates point of view as well, right? Uh, you know, our industry's had, most people have had this unique selling point of we're high touch for forever, but it, how much value is there, right? In the early mm-hmm. stages of high touch. Right. If I'm going to go and buy a car, yeah, I want to. I want service. I want to drive that car. I want to have an amazing experience. But by the same token, before I get in my current car and drive 30 minutes away, I want to know that the model I'm avail- that, that I'm looking for is is on the lot. I want to know that I can be serviced inside of an hour, so I'm not sat there. Like, there's really no point, even if you're doing high-end professional roles that are super high touch not doing a lip qualification using automation and yeah. then making it easier to book the recruiter. Yeah, yeah, I want to have an hour's conversation and learn about the role, but not if I know that I can't travel there and, and, and it's right. not got remote availability, not if it's not in my salary range, not if I know I'm not qualified for it. There's no value in that conversation to me. So I think you need to find that balance between doing, I've always done it this way, we're high touch, and I'm going, how can we just make this more efficient for everyone Correct. on both sides? Well, I think it's funny too, and such a great point that you bring up. And I, I know it's a little off the the, the, the topic of the sub, but it, but there is technology to help with that. But it's this, you know, always kind of being kind of holding the cards close. Well, I'm not going to tell you what the salary range is. Well, I don't want to waste my time as a candidate for 45 minutes only to find out this isn't in my range, or 
this job doesn't hit my needs. Like we can have a couple quick emails back and forth to see if it makes yeah. sense for you to spend your time and for me to spend my time yeah. on this opportunity because I'm not here trying to figure out all the ins and outs. I just want to know, I would hate for us to both spend an hour to find out we're 40 grand off on salary mm-hmm. and we've wasted both of our times. I mean, just little things like that. And, and there are ways to automate that, Jack. I mean, and I think you're right. I think that needs to be looked at as a whole. Um, and and really peel back your process, see areas, you know, spend those, spend a half a day with one of your good recruiters and see areas where you're like, Ooh, that's not very efficient. What can we do to help you be, make them more efficient? So Mm -hmm. great, great subject there, guys. And we go on with that one for a while. Um, our next topic here is, is maximizing efficiency through AI. Um, Mm -hmm. so, so the first question here, and we're going to, we're going to send this one right over to AJ is, uh, Mm -hmm. how have you seen AI improve recruitment work? specifically when dealing with high volumes of candidates. AJ? Uh, yep, yep, I'm here, man. I think, uh, you know what? You know, I honestly think, uh, I think it helped, I think it has helped, you know, I think automation has helped recruitment work, you know, manage expectations amongst the board, you know. You know, it used to be, a, if you think about just, old school recruitment before automation, <laughs> you know, the pressure of of how many candidates you would have to talk to, and then the pressure of, of you know, sending those candidates over to clients and still have to, the, the back and forth, like you were talking about earlier, Colin, but it's just like, you know, I think it's helped manage expectations in so many ways, and with, you know, especially with high volume, you know, um, you know, every recruiter, um, some, every recruiter doesn't have a source. Or most recruiters sometimes, when you're working, um, you know, you're working at 360 desks and you're working on 10 or 20 jobs and you're getting 100 or 150 candidates in, you need to learn how to manage your time. You know what I mean? But also, I think, you know, with automation, managers culturally have learned how to uh, overall, you know, you know, the pressure is not so high as it used to be back in the day when you, when a recruiter was working on 10, 20 jobs at once and trying to call and talk to 50 or 60 people. You're able to, you know, of course, get a lot of things out of the way, but it's also just, you know, it just helps you, um, it just helps you, helps you as a recruiter um, just advance and move forward in so many ways. I guess with high volume, um, with high volume, Sorry, I just got one of those blank thoughts. <laughs> with high volume, uh, working with high volume candidates as well, um, it really just al- allows you to. I want to say, like, when it when it comes to, um, and I'm just trying to phrase how to how to word this. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think I was. Uh, I think I've lost. Uh, wait a minute. I think we see we see a lot of AI help you right identify candidates right if you have okay. let's say 50 people apply to a job what what how can you leverage and, and when we say AI please know when we say AI we're, we're talking very on a loose term here we're not talking about Skynet right yeah we're talking about what what can your software technology do to help you start screening some of these candidates a little bit what, more efficiently what I was gonna say I guess I had wrote it down but most importantly because as recruiters, we're focusing we're focusing on so many things when it comes to high volume recruitment. One of the, the things that we don't tend to focus on the most is social media, and automation. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, automation has you know really helped us because right now I feel that anyone in our industry knows that in order to be ahead of the game, you have to be on social media. You got to be on Instagram, you got to be on Facebook, TikTok, you name it. If you want to be ahead of other agencies at the end of the day, but automate now that we have automation platforms that's able to, you know, post jobs for us, that's able to, uh, you know, start discussions, you know, in, in, in our groups online, you know, and LinkedIn groups and Facebook groups, uh, you're able to, you know, of course, start, you know, posting uh, just, topics and interests on Instagram to try to attract people is really helping, you know, of course, it helps with maintaining our reputation um, to make sure we're, we're seen as experts in our market. But it also just, you know, it's just convenient as well when you're doing so many different tasks, you know, you know, throughout the recruitment process. Agreed, agreed. I think there's a really easy way to leverage AI 
and technology to, to be more efficient, right? I mean, there, Jack was chatting about that a little bit ago as well. There, there's ways to automate, there's ways that you can utilize AI to help you if you're looking at a sea and ocean of candidates. There's some AI out there that can identify certain statuses of candidates and reach out to them for you or automatically put them on a list, right? So you can put your job into your, your CRM, your ATS, and it should yeah. kick out some candidates that might be a good fit for that. So again, being efficient with your time, maybe you're just a super good Boolean searcher, so you don't need that kind of stuff, that's fine. Yeah. But maybe we could put them into an automatic trip campaign and the AI can then kick somebody out once someone replies and you can know that that's a good candidate to reach out to, et cetera. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways to leverage that. I think everyone gets hung up on the AI piece um, yeah. and you know, it's something crazy and really expensive and, and, and it isn't. Um, so I think, you know, I think everyone thinks AI is going to somehow replace recruiters and I, I just don't see that happening I, anytime soon. I, I don't see it happen. So many scenarios that just happen on a daily basis. It's just yeah. impossible for it to replace recruiters, you know. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe talent acquisition, but not yeah. agency yeah. recruiters. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. That's yeah, a good feel like talent acquisition is just like going for an hour and a Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, I know, right? Once they once they figure that out, the internal group like, wait, so they can just screen them already for me? Crap. Yeah. Um, so the next the next topic here is handling quality without compromising, or excuse me, handling quantity without compromising quality. I know we kind of touched on that earlier. It's a big one for me, right? How can we make sure that we're keeping the candidate experience well? We're keeping in touch with our candidates, that we're keeping in well with our clients without. And when we're doing it at a volume and a scale, how do we make sure our foundation's in place to do that, which I think is set up through values of the company itself, then how can we leverage technology to do that? So our question here is, where can tech be useful in filtering through high volumes of candidates? Jack? So I think um, it's kind of essential if you've got serious high volume uh, to look at, at, at using to engage and drive people through the top of the funnel right so you know if you're thinking about it there's there's all sorts of different elements there's the qualification process there's the sourcing process in general um i think as the wider business you really need to consider you know working back from the end goal so if i've got um, a, a big client project where I go and need to go and deploy a hundred people on site somewhere or a thousand people on site and we've got clients that are dealing with situations with COVID or situations at the border where they literally need thousands of people yesterday. It is impossible to try and do that with an old school recruitment model. Um, so you need to work, work through the full funnel of going, okay, I need to try and make sure I'm putting as much in the top of it as possible in terms of, you know, candidate throughput. And then I need to make sure that I'm making and automating as many of the qualification stages as possible to get the end results out the bottom. It, it's basically just a typical sort of marketing lead function. And I need to have all of the reporting in place so that I can evaluate the performance of that. So, for example, on if you're working a proactive database, right? So, in that scenario, I could send out a survey to look at people's availability. And I could look at... Um, just ask them four or five qualification questions. I could look at even if it is super sort of high volume transaction, there's some automated dialers that as long as you've got the right number and you're asking the right qualification questions can eat through good data, not like robo callers, but just can say, hey, you applied for this job. I'm a piece of AI driven, you know, conversational bot. And I want to ask you three quick questions and book you in with a recruiter. You know, there's been some data that proves that for certain types of jobs, you get really surprisingly good conversion on that, right? And often it can speak multiple yep. languages as well, which not all recruiters can do. Um, even as simple as in the application workflow, using some sort of qualification as part of that apply, you know, and, and it needs to be, um, it needs to be well thought out. You can't just go through and have a really, really long application form where you're asking for the email address and you're asking for them to pre-register and you're asking them availability and you're asking five oh, qualification questions no, because no one's going to fill it out 12 fields, right? But could you get them no. to apply, capture their conversion and then to link? and then follow up with them five times automatically if they don't fill that link out, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. something that you know, we've built with a number of clients. And, and if you do that and allow them to then answer those questions on their own time, or you're proactive with an outreach or a text message that can do this thing, you, know, you might get 80% conversion. So you're getting really high conversion on capturing the lead, and then really high conversion on qualifying the lead, as opposed to just going qualify yourself. The way to think of it is just think of it as, as everything you do on the internet, right? When you're going to buy something, when you see an advert on Instagram and then you know, it just gets your email address and then suddenly it's 
you know, check out of your car. Here's a special offer. Don't mm-hmm. forget about this. Here's all our information about why we know so much about our market. Or when you're going through your apply insurance or a loan that you can do online. Yeah, it's a few hoops, but it's mobile optimized and it keeps you engaged. And at the end of it, it gives you an answer as well. Yeah. And, and all of this is stuff that our industry needs to sort of lean into um, a little bit more. I think probably the best way that you can ever evaluate something like this is actually thinking outside of um, staffing recruitment, right? We're yeah. really, really good at what we do. And talent acquisition is really good at what they do. But actually, if you look at like Lyft, Uber, Grubhub, Postmates, Deliveroo, you know, these organizations that literally come in and get some brilliant brains and go, how do we get 50,000 people to work for us in the gig economy over the next three months in this city? They don't think about it the same way that we do. And and they build it from a sort of digital marketing, e-commerce background. And, you know, you, you test out that experience of, of, even though you're not probably interested in doing it, just putting your email into like a Lyft app or something like that and see how much it follows you around the internet. And, and see how it will literally take you through a complete onboarding workflow through to deployment without ever talking to anyone. <laughs> so, you know, obviously, if you're doing professional recruiting, you know, 150 grand a year roles on direct hire, you are going to want to talk to them. But there might be some yeah. elements at the beginning and still sort of utilize to handle um, high volume candidates. And then final thing, I know long answer here, but it, exactly the same the other way around. If you're worried about quality, you know, if you're one of those people that say, we don't post because the quality is too low. If you can put the right workflow in place to monitor so that you're turning off poor quality sources, adding in good quality sources, you've got the right level of engagement. So you're putting the right information in front of people rather than just going apply, 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 and got the right automation to sort of qualify them out. You can still be efficient with inbound traffic which you're going to need if someone says hey i want 10 of these people next week even though you know you want your sort of high touch piece so yeah there's a whole load of elements where tech can be useful in in managing high volumes of candidates or high volume uh, projects yeah no i love that i love the thinking outside of staffing i mean marketing groups have been doing this for a very very long time in the last 20 years with technology very very efficiently and uh, staffing would would he to actually look into that and see how that works. I, I know recruiting agencies do a far better job with the application process. They only give me these three things. I'll spend the three seconds and look at your resume as opposed to, you know, that internal stuff where you'll see, hey, I need you to sign up with an account. Oh, you can't use that password. Oh, now you have to go to your email and check that. And then I need you to come back and I want you to upload your resume. And then I want to read you to regurgitate the whole thing for me again. And for passive mm-hmm. candidates, it's like, eh, I, I don't, that's way too much effort. Andrew, what kind of stuff do you see that really helps um, filtering through those high volumes? Um, I think Jack touched on it a bit, but I think, you know, having a, a really um, robust CRM or ATS, um, you know, and then that can do, um, you know, filtering within that system. So you're again, it's a, a it's a quick win for you. I mean, I know, you know, if we had volume roles, then we'd ensure we had sort of hot list, we called them, or gold list yeah. candidates, so that when, you know, right, I've got 17 jobs coming in, I can look on this list, I know I've got five, you know, gold candidates that I can ship off to the client. And I think on the ATS side, in terms of, you know, like you were saying, a bit like a buy it now button, like Amazon have, yeah. um, I think it's, you know, us at talent we do that you know we want to make it so you're not going through thousands of pages before you can do an application um you know make it nice and simple for people so that they don't become disengaged um so i think having those sort of robust systems in place that have got you know that that feature of speed and ease just ensures that you're still attracting the candidates and the high volumes Mm -hmm. Um, but you can then obviously filter through and make sure it's the right ones. And, you know, every candidate that comes through can go in some kind of a hot list. All right, you might not be right for this job, but you could be right for the job that comes in next week. So um, I think it's really important to, you know, make sure that, and again, that your recruiters or your TAs can actually use all the functionality on CRMs because I know some of them, you know, have got oodles of things. And, you know, it's like you say, you stick to what you know. Oh, I'll just do it this way because I know. Yeah, there could be a solution that you've missed and you've, you yeah. don't even think about that yeah. could save you, you know, half an hour of doing something. So, again, it's sort of that always constant communication with the people that are actually doing the, the, the recruitment to make sure they know which functionalities to use. Yeah. And there was a piece there you touched on, and I think it gets really lost, especially on the agency side, right? Where, oh, someone referred somebody. Well, hey, you know, if I don't have any roles that fit that person right now, I, great, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm not even going to probably entertain with a phone screen, but I'll send an email and say thanks and I'll let you know. 
we do agencies and recruiters, and I'm super guilty of this, do a, an absolute shit job of making sure that we keep in touch with that candidate base. So, you know, take that yeah. example, like when you click on something on the internet and all of a sudden it follows yeah. you around, yeah. be that candidate, right? There's nothing, you know, keep the candidates, put them on an, an e-newsletter and send something out once every week or every other week. Let them, you know, find, get them categorized by their skill set and maybe send out articles and have some AI in place that sends out articles in their skill set, right? Hey, here's a new thing that's going on with manufacturing engineering. And hey, we're putting Kaizen against Six Sigma. What are your thoughts? Keep them engaged because A, a you never know where they're going to land and they might end up being a lead for you for business development. They might eventually be a great fit for a role because if you somehow think, oh, well, I had a quick email with this person six months ago, they might not remember you. They might be, you know, you might be recruiting on a role that five other agencies are and they're getting there. That same person's getting hit up by five different agencies and they don't know you from Adam. But if you would have just taken that time to put them on a nice little drip campaign or to just set some reminders to, to ease. And again, you can leverage technology to do this for you guys. You can still keep in touch and keep that database fresh. Right. I see so many times where, where clients come over with a database that's got hundreds of thousands of candidates that haven't been touched in three, four, five, six plus yeah. years. What's the point? Yeah. You don't know what they've been up to. As a recruiter, if I run a search and I see that that resume is four years old, I'm not calling them. Why? Who knows where they are, what they're doing now? It's I'm out. I want to talk to the people we've talked to at least in the last year, maybe two. So what are you doing to freshen up that database? So leverage technology on that point, right? Just because that candidate yeah. wasn't fit for your role, we always say, oh, well, cool. We'll keep you in mind for the next one. Very rarely does that ever happen, right? I, I see, especially with TAs, right? Because you'll you'll apply for a job and then they'll say, oh, you're not a fit, but we'll let you know if anything else comes available. And then yeah, a few months later, you see that the job come available and you're like, well, shit, I'm a fit for that one. Why haven't they reached out? They're not going to. So put some stuff in place to make sure you are, right? I mean, I understand that candidate might not be a fit for your role today. And maybe they're in a, an industry that you might never have a role for them. But you don't know, maybe they'll become a hiring manager down the road and they'll remember that you have took the time to stay in touch with them and have those nice little tech touches throughout the, the process. And like Jack said, you all of a sudden you've been onboarded and you're all of a sudden drinking the Kool-Aid of this agency because they've just treated you well and kept you in touch, right? So I think that that can't be understated. I think we, we do a, don't do a great job of that. And there's a lot of technology in place nowadays to help you do a better job of that, to so leverage that. Yeah. Uh, our and, last and, question and here. Real quick, I mean, I'll just... yeah. So I was just going to say, it, it works too, right? We know our sites that if someone comes back for the second time because of an email or a text or re-engagement, they're literally yeah. three times as likely to convert. So yeah. I think I think people don't realize that because they don't have a marketing background. They used to do it the old school way. You, you don't realize it. Think about it. Most companies' number one source of, of, of talent is referral. And, and it's because you've got that trust. You've got that engagement from day one yeah. with quality. So it, it really does work. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And we have the technology now to track it. So you can see the ROI. You can see if it's working. So try it out. Give it six months. Um, our last question here is for AJ. Um, mm -hmm. How can recruiters best prepare for an increase in candidates? What can our foundation look like to be ready? Yeah, mate. Um, I would, I'm going to say, first and foremost, uh, if you guys are not using automation, <laughs> you need to sit down with you know, the head macho or who is ever in charge of the company. And, you know, I think it's time, you know, to have that discussion on why it's important and how it's going to save you guys both time and money. And most importantly, peace of mind, you know, moving forward um, to have automation set up. I also uh, would say um, for recruiters preparing for uh, increasing candidates, you know, start now, start you know, reaching out to candidates now so you don't get overwhelmed with a lot of, you know, applications and resumes. Um, I would advise you as well to set expectations in your automation follow-ups. So, you know, uh, when COVID hit, you know, we kind of had no choice but to just go with the flow, you know, but it wasn't a lot of uh, management around expectations. So, for example, uh, when you would set up a candidate, uh, when a candidate would have an interview with a client, um, some candidates would leave the like a video conference interview because the client never showed up. And sometimes you have to set that expectation like, hey, you got to wait five or 10 minutes because the software may be too slow or they may have forgotten, you know. So managing candidate expectations when it comes to 
interviews is going to be so important with the increase that you're you're going to be receiving. You're going to have to let these candidates know, you know, there may be it may be a, a slowness of software or it could be technical difficulties, but you know, make sure you communicate with me and I'm going to communicate with you. Uh, but also um, with an increase of candidates for interviews, I strongly, like I said, when COVID first happened, we kind of were just going with the flow. And I don't think we took the time to manage client expectations when it came to virtual interviews. Yeah. You know, I was still yeah. having, I still had clients trying to put five people on the call and interview one candidate and still have three or four rounds, you know, and now that everything is going back to normal, people are vaccinated. Some organizations are opening their offices and some are not. So you're going to have to compete with the companies where candidates, they may feel like, do I want to go through five virtual interviews or do I want to go back to into an office at this stage, you know? So managing your client expectations when it comes to the interview process I think is going to be very important to sit down with your client, let your client know we may struggle with, you know, de depending on everyone's technology, everyone's working from home, five people trying to jump on a call could really, you know, it could, you know, it could discourage candidates from filling out, from pushing out the interview you know, process. Most importantly, you just want to follow up with your can you know, you want to set up an automation uh, follow up where you're just checking in with your candidate because when you get high volume and that increase, uh, you know, of, of candidates coming in, they're interviewing other organizations. So you you want to kind of make sure you're aware of what's going on and how you can say a lot of things to, to keep them interested um, at the mm -hmm. same time. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I can, I, that's a great point there at the end. I, I think, you know, it's, it's really important to make sure you, you're starting a relationship with this candidate. So, you know, you want to make sure there's a little bit of trust there and Hey, maybe they go with your role. Maybe they don't, but there's nothing worse than getting ghosted from a candidate that's interviewed a few times. So if, yeah. if, if you're seeing that a lot, that means your recruiters aren't doing a good job of forming a good relationship. Yeah. Right. If a candidate accepts another role, that's okay, right? They, yeah. It's their life. They've got to put food on their table. They've got to do what's best for them. But if they're not letting you know, that's because they don't have a relationship that's strong enough with you and your organization to feel like they need to let you know about that stuff, right? Now, mind you, there's always people out there that wouldn't do that. But if you're transparent, hey, let me know about what, what positions you're, you're also interviewing for. It just helps me with my clients. No worries. Like, I'll be the first one to give you a high five. If you get another role, I know you're looking. You're a great candidate. You'll find a great spot. I just, you know, don't want to get left in the lurch if, if you find something and I don't hear about it. But if, if that's not happening, if, then that's a real good indicator that you don't have good processes in place or you haven't done a good job with your recruiters to make sure that building relationships yeah. is key, right? Yeah. And so what can you be doing to improve that? And AJ, to your point, is having some automations where you're reaching out to these candidates, where you're talking to them, where you're, you know, making sure that you're still, even if they're not a fit, you're still kind of get, keeping talking to them, right? And setting those expectations is huge. I, I, I yeah, I, lo I love all those points. That was a great, yeah. great wrap up, AJ. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we're right here towards the end, so I'm going to kind of kick it to you guys to kind of give us kind of some wrapping up thoughts here. And um, I want to thank all of you for for taking the time out of your day to be a panelist. And I want to thank everyone that hopped on the call today. Uh, it was great um, discussion here, and, and hopefully we can keep this kind of going throughout the future. Jack, kind of take us home here. What what last few thoughts you want to throw? I don't find a thought. I feel very Jerry Springer here. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, lean, lean, lean into the technology piece. Um, you know, don't be afraid of it. Um, you know, it's there to benefit you. Ultimately, it's there to make you faster. Uh, don't get overwhelmed in terms of, like you guys were saying, all the big stuff. You can do small stuff. Start with the small wins. Start with the low hanging fruit. You know, Rome wasn't built overnight. Build some confidence in it and then just, you know, keep, keep at it. Um, and I think you'd be surprised seen some people over the years that went went into it at all, lent into it, and within a couple of years they absolutely love they love automating processes, they love technology, they've really made it work for them. All right, AJ. Yeah mate. Um just do it. Like Nike says. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> look, uh, look, I mean look, we're 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 in a world where where recruitment is constantly adapting. So you have to keep up, you know, that is, if anyone knows me, that's mostly what I talk about a lot, staying ahead of the game, you know, automation is the future. It saves you time, it's convenient, it, it gives you peace of mind. Um, 
but also it opens up a lot of opportunities for you that you didn't even know was there or potentially possible within the recruitment space. So, you know, have an open mind and, you know, start diversifying yourself and, and, and definitely invest in the automation. Yep. I agree. Love it. All right, Andrea. Tell me Same. more. The guys have said really just lean into it and I think a real sort of a key element is communication. Just keep it open on every channel, you know, with your clients, with your candidates and with your staff mainly, I suppose, if you're adopting a new form of technology because um, they're the people on the ground at the end of the day. And if something isn't working, you need somebody to be vocal about that and, and let you know. So, yeah, just communicate. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. that was my, one of my favorite points from today was spend more time with your recruiters and find out what's what's working what's not right you just paid money for an, an automation or something what can is it working is it not working talk to you talk to your people well thank you guys all again it's been wonderful to chat with you i hope you all have a wonderful wonderful rest of your week all of you on the line as well thank you guys so much and have a wonderful week talk to you soon Thanks. Thanks.